Good morning. Woo, come on, who's excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I am. I'm glad that you are. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. I have to say happy Father's Day. I gotta say happy Father's Day to my sweet dad. He's got some of the best seats in Harvest. It's a recliner about five feet away from the largest screened high-def TV I've ever seen. So high def, in fact, that my dad, it's not uncommon for me to get a text either while I'm preaching or after church, one of three encouraging things. One, get a haircut. Two, you need to trim your beard. Or three, I love this one, I've gotten it once, I wouldn't even garden in those jeans, son. Don't wear those again. <laughs> so, um, happy, happy Father's Day to my dad. Dad, I got a haircut this week, shaved the beard, and wore nice jeans for you. And your card is in the mail. So, um, I... Uh, he, he modeled, true story, um, gentleness and, and humility and a quiet but powerful faith in the Lord that has molded me and made me the man that I am today. And I pray that you have a father. I always know as we, as we come in, whether it's Father's Day or Mother's Day, I, I know these are, are joyful days for many, but they're hard days for some too. And I, I'm aware of that. Um, I, you may not have a father who is with you today on this side of eternity, or you may not have a father that just modeled the love of the Lord in your life, but I'll tell you, um, you do have a heavenly father, and he is a good, good father, and as we have declared this morning, he is for you, and I pray that you feel that and you find that today. I'm so glad that you're here, um, that you're here in, in worship. Let me ask you a, a question as the song that we just heard is called The Blessing, came out in 2020, um, Cody Carnes, Carrie Job, Stephen Furtick, and Elevation Worship, very much like Bristol House Elevation, Stephen Furtick's the pastor. They have a recording label, and this song, The Blessing, that we just heard, comes from number six, and this Faith We Sing series, we're, we're talking about hymns, ancient and modern, and I'm gonna reference, I'm gonna teach from number six, the song that we just sang, and then we call it in the music world, we're gonna reprise it, and I think on the other side of hopefully hearing what is being sung over us, we can claim that and sing it, maybe in a different way as we close the service, but I've been thinking about, of all things this week, reality TV shows. Anybody a fan of reality TV? Anybody? Come on, a couple of you are like very apprehensively going, can I be a good Christian and say that I watch reality TV? I, I think you can. It's funny that in one of our production meetings, I don't know who brought it up, if it was Pierce or, or Susan, but we always, every Wednesday as a Harvest Leadership team, we, we check on our hearts, we pray over each other, but somebody said, all right, first question, if you could be on any reality TV show, which one would you choose? Susan Kent very boldly and quickly said The Amazing Race. I get that. Susan does a thousand things at the same time, and she would get to the pit stop first every single time. No questions there. Uh, Brenna Bullock said, Great British Bake Off. Anyone a fan of that show? <laughs> Who would not want to live in that world under that tent eating that food, right? Great. Pierce Drake, my brother, big brother is what he said. Okay, the Lord could use your testimony on that show. For me, personally... Fun fact about your senior pastor you may not know, Survivor. I have applied twice to be on the show Survivor. <laughs> True story. I even got a little anxious because four years ago I started thinking if Probst and CBS calls me, how do I explain to my then senior pastor, Dr. Rob, why I need 40 days off over the summer? Well, I have since said, you know what, just being senior pastor in the United Methodist Church in 2020 is enough of a reality show. I think it is called Survivor. So until someone snuffs out my torch, this is enough of a reality show for me. Point, point being, there is a point, there's always a point, I pray there is, is that there's a thousand reality shows that exist, not, not just here in this country. You know, all around the world, there are reality shows that, that are happening. I don't think anything's original. There was one reality show that I came across. I had no idea it existed. It was only out for one season. The year was 2005. It was on the BBC, so it was across the pond. It was nothing that we were ever subjected to. But I was fascinated by it. I had to do a deep dive and learn everything I could about it. Are you ready? It was called The Monastery. True story. Here's the premise of the show. They took five dudes, five men. 
that were, I guess, by all rights and purposes, you could call them scoundrels. One of them, an atheist, denounced God, went on a platform saying, there is no God. Another guy was a a criminal, had a hard life, and was out of prison. Another guy, his name was Tony. He worked in the adult entertainment industry. He was a director. They took five of the most scoundrel ragamuffins you could ever find, and here was the premise, For 40 days, you checked into a monastery and you lived with Benedictine monks for 40 days and 40 nights. That was it. Interesting, right? I was so fascinated by this. I mean... You live as a Benedictine monk, meaning you, um, you read the scriptures, you got up multiple times during the night, you had Eucharist on a daily basis, you did the prayers, you went out and you served the least and the lost. You had times of meditation, you had times of prayer. And what do you think happened to those five dudes that went in? All of them made all 40 days and every single one of them had a drastic transformation because they experienced God in a power way. Now, I think probably why it only lasted one season is probably the world is like, well, what's the fun in that? We're not doing that again. Oh, I love this story. One guy, his name was Tony. I watched a little clip from it. Tony was the guy who worked in the adult entertainment industry. In day 37, 38, I mean, he was about to, he realized that he was about to leave this place where he found a brotherhood, where he found an identity in Jesus, and he's not ready to go back into the world, and he's literally talking to one of the monks, his name was Brother Francis, and he's like, here's my problem, my vocation, I thought that the world is like, this is who you are. But when I experienced the presence and the power of God, when I sat in his word, I found that I've got a different name and I don't know what to do. I'm leaving this, but I don't know if that's where I'm called to be. And I wrote it down because it was so powerful. Brother Francis said this. He says, look, I want to I give you something that I think will help you with what you've just described. Vocation is about discovering who you really are and maybe what you should really be doing. And that's what we're trying to do here. Discover who we really are. He said, I want to give you this stone. And he hands him this white stone. He says, we have our Christian name, our our family name, but we also have another name, and it's called our white stone name. Revelation 2.17, read it later. But Jesus says, your name is written on a white stone in heaven. And Brother Francis says, I think our vocation is to find out what that name is to find out what our white stone name is. In other words, the world tells you this is who you are, but God has a different name for you. Maybe it's redeemed, maybe it's forgiven, maybe it's seen, maybe it's valued, maybe it's loved. And this, this, this one scholar, this commentator, was talking about this particular show, and, and he said this, quote behind me, I actually believe that Brother Francis here speaks to the heart of the fatherless generation. These are the sons and the daughters who don't know their true name. They spend their lives and they're searching for who they really are. And in their search, they bring this question of identity to anybody who will listen. They are willing to look anywhere to find it. It's powerful. And what I love about the blessing, what I love that I get to just share with you briefly today is that God is telling his people in the Old Testament that you have a name and my name is written on you. So what I want to do, this blessing that you find in number six, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to be in the book of Numbers. It's in the Old Testament, part of the law. So go to Numbers chapter six. This blessing is known as, I love this, the Lord's Prayer of the Old Testament. And you find that the blessing is in three very distinct pieces. So what I want to do briefly is I want to pick this blessing apart. I want to look at it. I want to look at what God is saying to his people then But we are also a people of the New Testament, and I want to look at where Jesus models what we just had sung over us. I think the secret, I've shared this before, the secret to reading the Old Testament is to see Jesus on every single page. (laughs) So, Numbers chapter 6. I'm going to start in 22. Before I do, context. Say the word context. I'm glad you said that. I care about context. Very good. 
What happens before a passage of Scripture and what you find after the passage of Scripture is always important when you are chewing, when you are meditating, when you are savoring on the Word of God. So here's the context of what you find in Numbers chapter 6. The Israelites, God's chosen people, are at the base, the bottom of Mount Sinai. They've been camping out there for about a year. God has already given to Moses the Ten Commandments. He has given them the law. So Moses has faithfully shared the law and the Ten Commandments to the people. Now, what's in front of the Israelites is Canaan. It is the promised land. On the other side of the River Jordan, the land flowing with milk and honey, but they also know they have a battle that is waiting for them on the other side of the River Jordan. God promises to get you to the promised land, but we want a promised land. We want the milk and honey. We just don't want the giants in the battle that's there. But see, there's going to be giants and battles on this side of eternity. We need to remember that. So God would give a word to Aaron, who is Moses' brother. Now, Aaron was a priest. So this is the priestly blessing. Now, a priest in the Old Testament, Aaron, they served two roles. Really, they faced two different directions. They served as intercessors on behalf of the people. Meaning, like, take the cross, right? So let's just say this is God. So what Aaron would do is he would stand between the people... And he would stand between the Lord and he would offer various sacrifices. In fact, in Leviticus, um, God would instruct Aaron. He would say, lift your hands, bless the people, but first offer three offerings. A sin offering, a burnt offering, and a peace offering. Three distinct offerings that were given. And remember, three pieces to this blessing that you can also associate each of these offerings. The sin offering was just that sacrifice, right, where the sins of the people were sacrificed so the people could be atoned. So the sin offering took care of the sin that existed on the people of God. The burnt offering was now that sin is taken care of, it's surrendering. We can now surrender ourselves to the Lord and stand in the presence of him, unblemished and without stain, when you take care of the sin, when you find your identity and you surrender to the Lord, the third offering is peace. All of a sudden, you have no sin on you. You are fully surrendered, so therefore peace comes as a result. So Aaron the priest was an intercessor. He stood between the people of God and the Lord, but he was also a voice of God, meaning that the Lord would give him words and the priest would share it to the people. Now you're caught up. So Aaron offered the sacrifices, the sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering. In verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now, we sometimes stop there. One more verse because this is equally as important. Here's your name. 27. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will finish it. Bless them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I will put my name, my name. I don't, God's not a fan of a fatherless generation, sons and daughters who don't know their title, who don't know who and whose they are. God says, I will put my name on this generation and I will bless them. Not I might, not if if they make me happy all the time, if they surrender to me, if they keep me in the center of their life, I will bless them. So part one, here's where I'll start. The Lord bless you and keep you. First thing you need to know is this. God wants to bless his people. God desires to bless his children. It is to the Father's delight. It is to the Father's heart to bless his children. I wonder how many times do I stand in the midst of a blessing 
But I'm missing it because I'm looking at everything else that's wrong in the world. I wonder how many times am I standing in the midst of a miracle? How many times am I standing in the goodness of God, but instead I'm choosing to dwell and focus on everything that's wrong? You need to know there is always something to give thanks for. Amen? You're like, no, there's not. I'm going to say, hopefully you are breathing right now. Let's just start there. I keep a gratitude journal. I've I've always been very transparent with you. I've struggled with anxiety, panic attacks, y'all. I've struggled with that my entire life. I have found, ask my wife, every night I gotta focus on gratitude. I have to write down the things, the blessings that God has given me. I've been doing this for years and there is not one night that I went, you know what, I can't come up with a single thing. Paul says in Philippians, whatever is good, pure, noble, trustworthy, praiseworthy, whatever is true, you need to think about such things. Remember, God, it is to his delight to bless you. The Lord bless you. Do you know the word bless? I I love the Hebrew language. I love it. Now, I also made a D in Hebrew in seminary, okay? Again, transparent. I'm gonna put that out there, not ashamed. You can love things, apparently, and not be great at them, But I love the Hebrew language because the Hebrew language is just, there's all of this richness in a word, has all of these pictures and these images that go with it. The word bless is barak, B-A-R-A-K, barak, bless. Do you know the meaning of bless is to, it is to kneel. The meaning of bless is to kneel and it is to serve. The Lord bless you. Now wait, how is that possible? There was a, a deep dive I did. A, a, a Jewish rabbi wrote a, a paper on Barak, on bless. And he actually used two illustrations. He used camels and the knee to talk about what that means. The Lord blessing you. You know, I don't know that you ever give your credit. Like, I don't know you ever thank your knee for doing what your knee does. If you don't have good knees, then you know how important the knees are, right? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah, It's interesting because what this rabbi would say, he said a couple things. Here's the thing with the knee, what the knee does in the body, it supports the weight of the body, it provides the body with flexibility and stability, and it's the largest joint in the body. And when you look at Barak, when you look at Neil, when you look at what it means to bend down, he said blessings support the weight of the body. That God blesses the church. He blesses the body. It is a way that he supports you, that he provides for you. That the blessings of God, that it provides us with stability, with flexibility. That it is just a huge component of what the Lord does. What does it look like to kneel and to serve as far as blessing goes? Well, let me point you to John chapter 13. You know this story. Just on the other side of the Last Supper, Jesus would talk about the body broken. He would talk about the blood poured out. He would talk about the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus would model what a blessing looks like. The evening meal was in progress. The devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal He took off his outer clothing. He wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What does Jesus do? Jesus blesses his friends by kneeling and by serving. He washes the feet of a doubter, a denier, and a betrayer, and Jesus would go on to say, don't waste the blessing, you do this for others too. The Lord bless you. Look at how God stepped into humanity, how he's true to his word, and keep you. You may feel like things are out of control. I've said this before, I'll continue to say it. Nothing under God's control is ever out of control. I love that he holds us, that he keeps us. Jude, one. Hey, Jude. Thank you, three people. You got that. 
Jude says this right before the book of Revelation, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. I love that Jude says he is able to keep you. He blesses you. He holds you. Second part of it is this. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you you. When you understand the first part, you understand that what we're saying is that God is the source of blessings in our lives. And if God is the source of blessings in our lives, then what we also know is that Jesus is the channel with which we receive those blessings. That he is the light that God was referencing. You hear the Lord, the Lord, the Lord in the blessing three times. Many scholars believe that this is just foreshadowing in Numbers chapter 6. That it's foreshadowing the relationship of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Corinthians, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness. That's Genesis 1-3. Remember, the very first thing God does, in the very beginning, you have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three in one, the Trinitarian God. They're swirling around, and it says the earth is dark, and the first thing God does is he says, let there be light, and he says it is good. The first thing God blesses is light, God has never been a fan of darkness. If you find that you're in a season of darkness in your life, listen, God doesn't want you there. And the good news of the blessing is this, the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. That's the beauty of Jesus, who he came to be. And lastly, the Lord turn his face towards you and give you, someone say the word, Peace, give you peace. See, there's just this, this, this beautiful domino effect. The sin offering, the burnt offering, the peace offering. The more you learn to find yourself in the identity of Jesus, the more you find that you are loved by the creator of the universe, the more you find that when you just get sin out of your life, when you release that darkness inside you and you hand it over to the light that God welcomes you and peace comes As a result, where's the band? I need the band to come out on the stage and play me off. All right, peace. (laughs) Peace, I love this. Peace, look at this card, is more than the absence of strife. Shalom is a, a blessing that you give, shalom. Shalom actually means the restoration back to the original state. God's peace is not just Harmony, but it's wholeness and completion. Jesus says, John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Church, what I want you to get this morning as we sing the blessing is this song is not just being sung to you because we are royal priests. We are a chosen people. That as we sing this song, Brenna, Zaria, this group, we're singing it to you, but we claim this. This is our song. So we sing this over fathers. We sing it over mothers. We sing it over our children. We declare to the generations that God is not dead. That he is alive, that there is hope, that you have a name. You are not your brokenness. You are not your sin. You are a child of the most high God. Will you stand? Come on, let's stand. We're going to go big. We're going to sing this big today. I want to shake the ground. I want people over in Whole Foods to go, what's happening right now? Y'all hear that? That's what I want. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face, lift up his countenance. That means smile. The Lord looks at you, smiles at you, and gives you 
peace. Let's sing it. Sing it over one another. Sing it over our children. Sing it over a fatherless generation. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, amen.